This is about the final firmware update for Plasma, which adds functions for an external QWERTY keyboard. Now I'll demonstrate the keyboard with a simple program, but before I start there have been a couple of other updates since the last video. One is a memory increase. Hooray! The MCU memory I'd set aside for firmware development can now be handed over to the Plex emulation, so the total memory has doubled from 1024 to 2048 words. That's luxury. The other change is a new option for the Plasm assembler, and it can now copy any file into a format suitable for any of the storage peripherals paper tape, mag tape, or disk drive. This means you can preload miscellaneous data for processing. And lastly, but most importantly, this is the new media library. Now back in the day this was a huge room full of 10 inch mag tapes on racks, so a bit of imagination is required. So to tie all these together I'll get Plasma to print out the source file for the keyboard demo program before we discuss it. I'll use Plasm in the new raw mode to copy the source file into magtape format. The dash R says raw and the G is magtape. Just for interest this is the magtape file contents. Each block has a 16 byte header with a checksum and then the data section where you can probably recognize some of the source code. And this is the start of block two, again with its header, followed by the data, and so on. You can then copy this to an SD card, which represents a mag tape, and mount it on the machine. I'll just load a paper tape program written earlier, which will list the contents. And the prompt says it's waiting for a keypad button to say which peripheral to list. And this switch sends the data to the printer instead of the screen. I'll press button two and off it goes. And of course, this is where I forgot to press record on the printer camera, so I'll do that now. And this might take a while, so I'll be back in a tick. Okay, and here's the demo source code just printed. Now you may be too young to appreciate the enormity of this moment. This is the first program printout on fanfold paper I've held in my hands for decades. It's not quite the wide 132 column stuff we used to pore over. I couldn't find a wide printer for sensible money, so I had to compromise. But these printouts kept me busy and paid for hundreds if not thousands of hours in my early career. And the program just reads keys from the keyboard and displays them on the opera screen. There's an earlier video which covers the Plex instruction set, but I don't think I've covered the assembler in detail, so I'll take a quick detour through some of the features used in this demo. And the assembler, Plasm, is fairly basic and just uses a single prefix character to distinguish items. The semicolon, which is a standard comment symbol, means that the rest of the line is ignored. The percent symbol is a directive, and the letter after it denotes the type of directive. S says source code, and the number one, two, or three corresponds to the three instruction sets supported by Plasma. One and two are the Toy A and Toy B emulations, and three is Plex. The instruction mnemonics and syntax are different for each one, so Plasm needs to know what to expect. The squiggly brackets here indicate comments which span multiple lines, and a hash symbol is an equate, uh, which equates a name to a number, so you can use that name in your code for clarity. 
Here's an example, the tabs spacing is set to eight here. So I can use the name tabs elsewhere in the code. Now this I directive specifies an include file. So you can split your source across multiple files. Now this particular file, Plex functions, is where I've put all the equate definitions for the IO functions. So for example, instead of saying hex 2a00 to clear the opera screen, you can just say op clear or whatever you decide to call it. Right, the M directive defines a memory address for all subsequent statements. And you may remember Plex has a fixed store region from address 0 to 15, which is hex F. So normal user memory starts at address hex 10. A dot prefix indicates a label. So this bit of code here shows a system IO function, clear the upper, and all peripherals run asynchronously to the CPU. So the code loops back to this label if the opera was busy at the time. And finally, the D directive right at the end indicates a data section, which in this example is where an array or buffer is stored. This percent %p is a pad instruction, which can pad out an array or an area of store with a particular value. The assembler understands basic expressions, so this pad directive initializes the buffer with columns, times, rows, space characters. OK, back to the code itself. This section is just for testing. The keyboard is currently not implemented in the Plasma Sim simulator, but the 16-button keypad is. So this code detects which platform the program is running on, either the sim or the real machine. And here's the machine section. And these are the two new I.O. functions for reading the PS2 keyboard. There are only two, and just like the keypad, there's one function for checking the status and one to read the key. And even though a lot of functionality is hidden inside the I.O. functions, Writing even a simple program like this is quite an eye-opener as it shows just how much we take for granted. Now I wanted the backspace key to delete the character underneath the cursor and even that simple operation took several attempts to get the right character to disappear and then leave the cursor in the right place. And I also wanted a flashing cursor so again that needed to be coded. So this is the main loop. It waits for a key to be pressed then reads it and handles it. The IO function sets the N flag if the key is a normal printable ASCII character. So that saves a lot of checking. And the code jumps to keyboard ASCII if the N flag is set. And this is keyboard ASCII and it basically just displays the character. Now, I won't go into the details of update buff but just to point out the character code is in register 0 but it's only there for a brief period of time as the register is reused in other sections. So there's an extra instruction here which just copies the character from register 0 to register 9 so we can see it later when the program is running. Here's the disp character function and it just calls a system IO function upper right character to write the character to the current position on the screen. The current position is held in registers A and B. A holds the X value or column from 0 to 35 and B holds the Y value or row from 0 to 17. And you'll see these when the program is running. And finally, this check caret function is called while it's waiting in this loop for a key and this handles the flashing cursor. It uses one of the four system delays or timers to control the flash speed. And when the timer expires, the Boolean value in register C is toggled and either the caret or the original character is displayed. OK, that's the theory. Now for the practice. I'll load the program and run it.
Right, here's the flashing cursor waiting for a key. And here's me trying to type something sensible while leaning around the camera tripod. Here's register 9 holding each ASCII character code. This is a lowercase a, which is hex 61. Here's b, 62. c is 63, and so on. Here are the numbers. 0 is hex 30. 1 is 31. 2 is 32, and so on. Here are the x and y screen coordinates in registers a and b. x is the column number starting at 0 on the far left and Y, the line number, starting at zero at the top. The arrow keys on the keyboard move the cursor around. The enter key does a new line. The tab key jumps to the next tab position, which, as we saw, is set to eight. Here's the backspace key, deleting characters. Now this is the Boolean value in register C, which says what to display, either the character or the cursor symbol. The timer value is in memory location C3, and the units are hundredths of a second. It's currently decimal 30, which is hex 1E. And if I patch that to say decimal 10, which is hex A, you'll see the cursor flash faster. The timer value only takes effect on the next key press. Now the cursor symbol itself is in location BA, so I could change that from B0, which is a rectangular blob, to 1, which is a smiley face. Now as mentioned, lowercase letters start at hex 61, if I press and hold shift, we get 41, 42, 43, and so on. So the only difference between upper and lower case is this bit five. So a well-known trick for converting one to the other is to set or reset bit five, depending on which way you want to convert. Okay, that's the user program view of the keyboard. What about the underlying IO functions? How do they work? Well, I chose to use an old school PS2 interface as this seemed simpler than USB, but just like the old school Centronics printer interface, the information on the internet is not 100% accurate. In the end it was simple, but only after more head scratching and probing around with the scope. And it turns out these keyboards contain a surprising amount of intelligence. The computer support department where I used to work referred to keyboards and mice as consumables. They just threw them away if there was a problem. Which is a shame as they're not just a matrix of switches. The first thing you discover is that they don't assume anything about the individual keys, which could be a good or bad thing depending on your point of view. These are the scope traces direct from the keyboard for letters A, B and C. The top trace is the clock signal, the bottom is the data. And no matter how you count the highs and lows, you won't see the code patterns 61, 62 and 63 we saw earlier. So if you want nice ASCII character codes, your driver program has to do the conversions. But the advantage is that the same keyboard hardware can be used for different countries with different key layouts. The keyboard also does nothing special with the shift keys. As far as it's concerned, they're just regular keys. Again, this makes it very flexible, but means the driver has to do more work. And this is where the intelligence comes in. The keyboard gives you several options for detecting key states. The simplest option is to just send a unique code when a key is pressed. But this is no good if you want to check if multiple keys are pressed at the same time. So there's another option to tell the keyboard to send additional codes when a key is released. This means you can check if a shift key, say, is held down when a letter key is pressed. In which case you would convert the letter code into uppercase which is where that bit 5 trick comes in handy. 
And if you're not bothered about multiple key presses, you can keep the interface simple and turn this option off. And there's a third hybrid option where different modes can be applied to individual keys as opposed to all of them. And all of this means you can configure the keyboard for different applications. You could use it as a simple games controller with all keys acting as control functions or as a typewriter for a word processor with a full set of shift, num and caps lock keys and so on. The Plasma's driver only handles a basic key layout with shift and caps lock and it ignores the numeric keypad section but that's good enough for my operator's keyboard requirement. So as you've probably guessed by now the keyboard interface is bi-directional or two-way and there are a set of commands which you can send to the keyboard to control its behaviour. Even the three lights, the num lock, caps lock and scroll lock, are driven by a command. They are not handled automatically by the keyboard. And this makes sense given its strategy of leaving everything open-ended. Here's the plasma driver toggling the caps lock light whenever the key is pressed. The state is held within the driver and is used to convert letter keys to upper or lower case before passing them up to the user I.O. functions. Now if you had no interest in the num lock or scroll lock lights, you could use all three lights for a more noticeable caps lock indicator. Although maybe this is going too far. There's one other command I want to mention, which controls the typematic feature. This is where key press codes are sent repeatedly if a key is held down. You can see this on most standard computers. There's an initial delay before the repeat begins and the repeat rate. Now this feature is one of my pet hates and I did not want it on Plasma. So many times I've seen beginners get frustrated when they're not used to a keyboard. They hold keys down a fraction too long and suddenly get a load of repeated characters. Now I knew you could change these settings on a computer, but I did not realise the feature is actually built into the keyboard itself or at least it is on these old PS2 models. So Plasma's driver turns this feature off and I can now press and hold a key as long as I like and you just get a single character. Perfect. And if I change my mind later, I'll probably squeeze in another IO function to make it user controllable. Right, that's it for now. Hope that was interesting. And in case you're wondering, the video title refers to a short science fiction story which has stuck with me since childhood my uncle had a huge collection of sci-fi books and it used to be a real treat for us kids to read these back in the 50s and 60s. This one was by Frederick Brown, who had a fascination with typesetting machines. He also wrote another intriguing one called The Angelic Angleworm. Links in the description below. Okay, that's really it. Thanks for watching.